assistant professor at the Department of Indigenous Studies here at USASC. I have been working with the Native Law Centre and the Department of Sociology for the past two years on developing this speaker series. And so today, this is a partnership uh, for the speaker series that we called Indigenous, Social and Legal Perspectives on Meal Pamachahoan. And as I mentioned, this is a partnership with Indigenous Studies, the Native Law Centre and the Department of Sociology. So you're all here today because you would have seen the advertisements and the discussion about having uh, David Garneau come and speak to us today. So I'm going to introduce him very briefly and then allow him to take over and introduce himself and, and get going. Okay. So David Garneau is a Métis scholar and artist. He's an associate professor at the, in the Visual Arts Department at the University of Regina. He's really affected and impacted my work over the past years. His thinking about reconciliation, his thinking about uh, irreconcil irreconcilable, in, oh, sorry, let me say it like this, irreconcilable spaces in terms of the relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canadian society is really, has really impacted me. So it, it's my great honor to be introducing him today. Last thing I'll say about him is just a little bit of his focus in terms of the kind of work that he does. Uh, he's focusing on various aspects of nature and culture, masculinity, ethnicity, specifically with Métis heritage, and contemporary indig Indigenous identity formation. So with that, I'll just keep it, I'll end it there, and please join me in welcoming David Garneau. Thanks. All right, so glad to be here. Um, so there's some key terms, and... Uh, I might get to some of them, but certainly not all of them. Uh, I'm going to do my best. So I want to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis, my nation. I honor the elders, knowledge keepers, and land protectors, cultural producers, past and present of this beautiful place. I am a grateful guest. I offer respect from Treaty 4 territory, home of the Cree, Soto, Assiniboia, <clears throat> and also some Métis down there too. And thank you, Damien Lee, for uh, inviting me. Thank you also to the University of Saskatchewan, Departments of Sociology, Indigenous Studies, and Native Law Centre for ho hosting me. Um, so I will make a reference, uh, the name Boyden, I just put that in there to make you scowl and come into the room. <laughs> I'm just going to put it at the end. I'm going to lead up to it. You got to eat a lot of um, oh, carrots and, and broccoli and cauliflower before you can get to some meat and gravy. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. My name is David Garneau. And I get a correct, uh, as of yesterday, I'm now full prof. So I'm no longer just associate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I never th thought I'd see the day. Um, and because it's weird because I don't have a terminal degree. I've got a diploma in early childhood education. I worked in daycare for years in Alberta and um, including a place called the Atonement Home which was like an Indian residential school run by the Grey Nuns and Franciscan Sisters in Edmonton and their camp at Lac Saint Anne. And uh, then I went on and did a BFA in painting and drawing and then an English degree, master's degree in American literature. So you'll hear a lot of play on words and concern for use of language in there. Um, but yeah, without a terminal degree, a PhD, I shouldn't really be here, but they're still letting me pull a salary. And hopefully, hopefully I'll show you why. <laughs> um, well, instead of leave that for later. Oh, I'll put him on there for now. What the hell? I haven't read any of his novels, and so I have nothing against the guys, honestly. But you may notice that in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Report and calls to action, oh, I forgot to say, in terms of family, um, my family comes from uh, Red River. My great-great-grandmother, Eleanor, was uh, Swampy Cree and uh, Scottish, and my great-great-grandfather, Laurent, was uh, French-Canadian and uh, Anishinaabe, and then they moved after the Troubles of 1869-70 to Edmonton. And I think, I don't think I'm showing a slide, but um, there's still a property there, the University of Alberta started slowly encroaching on called the Garneau District. That was their, their river lot. So I descend from those guys and 
maybe at the end I can talk about some of the artworks I've been doing to try and renew the relationship between the Papas Chase disenfranchised band of Edmonton and, and Garneau's and so on. So as I said, you may have noticed that in response to the TRC report and calls to action, Canadian universities, art galleries, museums, and other institutions are making great efforts to indigenize. Statues of Cornwallis here in Halifax uh, are being defaced. Uh, we have uh, just recently the John A. Macdonald statue in Regina, which I had nothing to do with at all. <laughs> that wasn't me. It's true that since I came uh, to Regina from, uh, from Calgary in, uh, 18 years ago, uh, in November, I'd always go and lay a little noose at his feet and then bigger ones. And uh, someone from the city finally got back to me after a performance I did there and says, I was the guy who cleared them. Uh, but I didn't use spray paint. That wasn't me. That wasn't me at all. But I was surprised because I got there and realized here's the city where Riel was hung. And it's the only statue on all of the prairies of John A. Right? If that isn't a trophy, kind of like a scarecrow warning Métis to shut up, I don't know what is. Uh, but also, street names here we have in Kelowna and Toronto are being renamed to recognize indigenous peoples and languages. Some schools and artists refuse to celebrate Canada 150. Many have been critical of the colonial celebrations. Mandatory indigenous classes are demanded for university students and some are even offered. Following the Oka crisis, the Canada Council for the Arts created dedicated funding for Indigenous arts. Um, this play on words of, of reconsidering reconciliation as reconciliation is something that I gave in a paper in uh, Toronto some years back and they, they actually adopted it. And I will talk about this reframing a little bit. And then now following Idle No More and the recent Canada Council restructure, the focus and funding is increasingly uh, dramatic in terms of applied to indigenous projects. There is so much talk about decolonizing institutions and ourselves. Why? Oh, so there's my university. Together we are stronger. Indigenous, indigenous. Justice, right? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission exposed the truth about Canada's genocidal treatment of native children in Indian residential schools. While this is the center of the TRC and its calls of action, it is clear that reconciliation is not only or primarily about redressing harms to individuals, it is about understanding the settler desire, I gotta say this one slow. It is about understanding the settler desire that native people no longer exist. It is about the settler, the understanding, about understanding the settler desire that native people no longer exist and remediating it. Whether through starvation, assimilation, mass incarceration and adopting out, or a campaign of loss and humiliation leading to self-immolation, Canadians as colonizers need natives gone or absorbed into Canada so they could access the land and resources. Canada has always been proud that unlike the United States, they did not conquer Indians through war, but swindled them with paper and promises. This is the original sin that made the country possible. This is the settler's inheritance and the immigrant's burden. Now that this is in the public consciousness and people gradually see this as a stain, how do we natives and not live with these truths? So beyond justice, beyond righting the wrongs we can, how do Canadians reorganize themselves in relation to native peoples so we can all live together appropriately healthfully and productively on shared territories. First, we have to recognize our colonial heritage and its continuance. Winston Churchill perhaps best art articulates the settler colonial attitude in 1937. And he said, I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race has come in and taken their place. It is refreshing to have the foundational sentiments of colonial thinking so plainly stated by one of its leaders. Most Canadians believe they live in a post-colonial country, independent since 1867. But First Nations, Inuit and Métis remain in a colonial state. Most of our lands are occupied 
and our lives, go our lives governed not by Britain, but by Canada. I use the word non-colonial to indicate that because we do not live in a classically post-colonial country, uh, post-colonial theory arising from those states must be employed here with caution. There, in post-colonial states, decolonization includes the actual, actual exit of colonial power. Here, in Canada, decolonization is the imagined transformation of minds, right? It's a symbolic economy and intuitions on still occupied territories. And therefore, we need new ter terms and tools to figure this dramatic difference. So let's start with the difference between uh, conciliation and reconciliation. Conciliation is the action of bringing into harmony. It is extrajudicial. It is an extrajudicial process that is a conversion of a state of hostility or distrust, the promotion of goodwill by kind and considerate measures, and, and peaceably or friendly union. The word calls to mind the meeting of two previously separate parties into an amicable process. Okay, they could have chosen that word, but they didn't. Reconciliation is a seeming synonym, but with a difference. Reconciliation refers to the repair of a previously existing harmonious relationship. Right? So the assumption in using the word reconciliation is that we had a previously existing harmonious relationship. Anybody here feel we've got that? No? Oh. Some people have, right? That's why I love art so much. There are a lot of repressed stories of First Nations people, Métis people who had really good relations with their neighbors. I've met two of them. It's, it's possible, right? <laughs> but in the general state, nation to nations relationship, definitely not. Uh, so reconciliation is a seeming synonym with a difference. Reconciliation refers to the repair of a previously existing harmonious relationship. In the present situation, this word choice imposes the fiction that equanimity was the status quo between indigenous people and Canada. It is true that for many generations after contact, some indigenous peoples had good relations with some Europeans as individuals rather than nations. Of course, this was because there was there were no there were, this was because there were way more Indians here than the Europeans. The serious troubles only began when visitors decided to become settlers, when traders were replaced by ever-increasing waves of colonists, when invading nations decided they'd rather own the land than share it. This reached a crescendo when the territories became Rupert's land and then Canada without negotiations with the original inhabitants. The problem with the choice of the word reconciliation over conciliation in our current discourse is that it creates a false understanding of our past and constricts our collective sense of the future. The word suggests that there was a time of general conciliation between First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada, that this peace was tragically disrupted by the Indian residential schools and will be painfully restored through the pro current process of reconciliation. If you consider treaties to constitute, constitute the original conciliation, Recall that most of BC and Quebec and many other places in Northern Turtle Island remain unseated. Talk with the descendants of native signers. They testify that their ancestors did not cede territory, but agreed to share the land up to a plow's depth in exchange for peace and compensation. If not a deliberate swindle, some significant things were clearly lost in translation. To the dishonor of both First Nations and the Crown, the numbered treaties were betrayed so quickly after signing that they can hardly count as conciliation, conciliations. The agreement with Métis were similarly dishonored. In addition, apart from a few recent ones, treaties are between native nations and the English monarch. The transfer of that power, the crown to Canada, was made without a negotiation with First Peoples, who are the original co-signers that made Canada possible. Again, talk to the descendants. They recognize a relationship with the English crown. Recognition of a Canadian crown requires new nation to nation's treaties, conciliation. The constant repetition of the word reconciliation creates a screen for the content conciliation. It expresses the present wish that there truly was a past comprehensive statement in order that our future can be bearable. Another thing is uh, reconciliation is actually a right in the Catholic Church. And so it's kind of ironic that they were using, chose this term, not that Benjamin De De Desmond Tutu, bishop, uh, chose it, 
But it, what it means is that if you are part of the church and you sin, you are outside of the church, physically kicked out or emotionally you pull yourself away. And by reconciling, yeah. You're so fast. You're too fast for me. <laughs> too fast. So what it is, get this picture. Okay, so I have to admit, um, my uncle is a bishop, my auntie is a nun, and my mom married a Jesuit priest. So I know what this stuff is. So when I first read it, I thought, this is really creepy. Okay, so the idea is, so think of the church, and then we're going to pretend it's like the state. The church says, if you sin, even if it's in your heart, you're outside of the community. You feel like shit, or you're kicked out, and you're made to feel like shit, right? Now, the transgression might have been something you did wrong, or you could have been just queer or something, and you get kicked out. It doesn't matter. The, the state of the church is a perfect being, kind of imperfect, but perfect being. And we're imperfect, and we have to reconcile ourselves. It's one of the rights of the church, right? You've got to go to confession. Did anybody go to those TRC events? It was a confessional, right? I went to lots of them, and it was very sad. And there were people confessing. Sometimes the first time publicly, their families didn't even know some of these things. Okay? But that was their way. They knew, right? If they're raised Christian or Catholic, that's how they could reconcile with their family. Reconciliation about family members is a real thing. We have to reconcile with their family. We have to reconcile with ourselves. Elders that I talk to say that, and I totally, you know, when they, they hear me talking like this, I say, no, no, that's real. We have to do that. But do we have to reconcile with Canada? We have to decide that for ourselves. But if the state, nation state is perfect, and we're the ones who have to confess in order to get back in, separatism is maybe a better solution. I'm getting off script, sorry. I'm in a teaching mode instead of a reading mode. And that takes longer. So the first line of the TRC website mandate page still reads, I thought they'd take it off, but it's still there. There's an emerging and compelling desire to put the events of the past behind us so we can work towards a stronger and healthier future. This is where you start becoming a psychoanalyst. Whose desire is this? If it is a colonial desire, then reconciliation is the continuation of the settlement narrative. The word conjures images of halcyon moments of conciliation before things went wrong as the site of national origin. It pictures the Indian residential school era as an unfortunate deviation rather than just another aspect of the ongoing colonial struggle to contain and control Aboriginal people, territories, and resources. The present colonial desire is to put the events of the past behind us and reconcile Aboriginal people with this narrative not with Canada, with this narrative. The reconciliation narrative anesthetizes knowledge of pre-contact Aboriginal sovereignty and creates in settler minds the sense that Indigenous people are Canadians just like them and that they came into being with Canada, that they are simply a minority interest group rather than the pre-existing hosts and partners who made Canada possible. So we'll go back to the East. They got some wisdom over there. So this understanding is eloquently figured in the two row wampum treaty belts. So two boats, in this case a British ship and an Iroquois canoe, go down the river of life together but do not touch. Two communities live parallel to each other, trade, but do not violate each other's space and customs. They do not try to steer each other's vessel. Two states acting as states can establish a neutral space of negotiation between their communities in which general conciliation established as a living agreement. And universities can be one of those neutral spaces. A relationship that does not compromise each other's core spaces. Okay, so there are separate spaces of whiteness, separate spaces of indigeneity, or sorry, of aboriginality, but there can be a common space in places like art galleries, museums, and universities that I would call indigenous. Neither Aboriginal, not really fully Cree or Métis, but not completely colonized and European either. Uh, conciliation relation, uh, conciliation is not the really erasure of difference or sovereignty. Conciliation is not assimilation. However, because treaties were not entered into in good faith by the colonizers, 
but were conceived as nonviolent means to subdue original habit inhabitants, we ought to reconsider their conceptual value as a firm or only basis for, for present relations. The treaties are historical facts, but honoring them requires a continuous relationship which includes interpretation, reinterpretation, and renegotiation. This is perpetual conciliation. So I'm going to talk about something I know a bit better than pretending to talk about the law, and that's uh, museums and art galleries. But so when I say museums and art galleries, think universities and classrooms. So museums were never public institutions in the sense of standing outside of the state and functioning as a means of criticizing it, explains Tony Bennett. They are designed to produce meanings that serve the needs of the nation and those citizens who, citizens who most benefit from it. They perpetuate dominant ideology, especially in the middle and professional classes who's, who exchange cultural institutions to learn what is expected of them. These publics go to museums to absorb the cultural competencies necessary to secure and reinforce their social status and distinguish themselves from the working classes. If we reconsider Bennett's critique in terms of colonization and transpose working class with Aboriginal people, we get some insight into why, while these storehouses hold tons of Aboriginal objects, they notoriously attract few native guests. Remember, if you're hearing museums, think universities. Simply put, they're not for us. To paraphrase and repurpose Bennett, heritage museums in still colonial countries are designed for settler audiences to absorb the cultural competencies necessary to distinguish them from Aboriginal peoples and thereby reinforce and perpetuate their settler colonial status. Okay, this is Bennett. I'm going to come up with some uplift in a minute if you're getting depressed. Contemporary heritage museums and art galleries formed within colonial capitalist and entertainment paradigms require novelty. Actually, I like that. I'm going to read it again. So contemporary heritage museums and art galleries, and sometimes universities, formed within colonial capitalist and entertainment paradigms require novelty. The Aboriginal and other forms of embodied descent are tolerated as long as they surprise with consumable difference but do not threaten to inspire beyond the aesthetic and the affective. Worse still, if assimilation remains the unstated desire of settler Canada, then the vogue for, for so-called decolonial adjustments to exhibitions and the addition of community consultations, indigenous curatoria, but not quite curation, may simply be the machinery of assimilation in slow motion and with a new name. If so, then it is understandable if conscientious Aboriginal curators and audiences, professors and students, decline or limit their participation. I'm talking about museums and galleries, but of course, if the shoe fits. Any native cooperation with colonial institutions, argue First Nations political thinkers, Glenn Coulthard and Tayaki Alfred, is a compromise of sovereignty on the way to cultural and physical annihilation. They advocate for Aboriginal-only keeping houses, what I describe elsewhere as irreconcilable spaces of Aborigin Aboriginality and sovereign Aboriginal display territories. And some of these places actually do exist. Oh, I'm just jumping ahead there. Some of these places actually exist. They're growing and are central to separatist futures. However, I'm interested here in the possibility of collaborative futures. Ones in which colonization is transcribed by transformed by indigenization rather than vanquished by uh, dreams of violent revolution. My view is that heritage museums, art galleries, and universities are not necessarily, always, and only propaganda machines. We are, of course, compromised in that whether we promote, resist, or simply benefit from colonization, we are already infused in this system. However, not all such engagements are equal or total, and not all compromises are pernicious. Contemporary museums, art galleries, and universities do not simply reflect state ideology, but produce it. They also articulate the state's discontents and figure its remedies, one of it which may be the indigenous. The taste for imperialism has soured and colonization in countries now known as Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and occasionally in the United States 
has shifted from the brutish invasion, broken treaty, and forced assimilation stage to the dominant culture's present wish to entreat survivors with what they call reconciliation. This activity is played out most poignantly in museums and other sites where history, nation, and identity struggle in formation. With respect to Bennett, whatever their origin, contemporary heritage museums, art galleries, and universities are now places where citizens not only learn who they are and what and are not, but these are places where you go to change your mind. And if there is a collective and explicit will to transform these institutions from sites of colonial reproduction to spaces of colonial non-colonial conciliation, then indigenous curators and audiences, faculty and students should co-author that future. The evolution from genocidal dispossession to conciliation is part of an international social justice program codified in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples which recognizes and attempts to ameliorate past and current injustices. But scholars, environmental and other uh, non-Indigenous activists go further. Canadian scientists like David Suzuki, philosophers like John Ralston Saul, and innumerable Native authors, educators, and leaders find in traditional Indigenous ways of knowing and being an antidote to the colonial, capitalist, patriarchal, and racist traditions that have engendered intolerable social justice and environmental calamity. In turn, sorry, this turn is called anti and decolonization, reconciliation, and especially among Canadian academics, indigenization. If enacted rather than simply entertained, indigeni indigenization could upend the conceptual basis of the colonial state and require true conciliation between the settler nation and indigenous nations in a shared non colonial territory. I'm Métis. We descended from the union of First Nations women and European men, overwhelmingly French and Scottish, and then from Métis interunions and other Métis Sage. Not all mixed bloods Aboriginal people are Métis. Most are status or non-status First Nations or settler assimilated Métis, descended from families who lived on the northern plains and woodlands of Turtle Island for generations before the founding of Canada. The Métis saw themselves and were recognized by the First Nations cousins as a separate people. For our flashy clothes, we'll, we were known as the flower bead people. Acknowledging our independence, the Cree call us Optimsimwak. I'm not Cree, so that was probably a horrible pronunciation. But the people who own themselves. This is my painting, I paint like this. In the late 1800s, after armed resistances at Red River and Batoche, and through a type of treaty that included reparations for expropriated land, Métis were partly recognized by the new Canadian state before they were dispossessed. When the Constitution is repatriated in 1982, we were formally acknowledged along with First Nations, Inuit, and as Aboriginal. I first went to Australia in 2008. Before that, I had never flown, never been anywhere outside of the northern part of Turtle Island here and mostly on the prairies, uh, Alberta, um, uh, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So when I went to Australia in 2008, it was with the Canada Council for the Arts a delegation of First Nations and Métis curators. We were sent to the Sydney Biennale, an art festival. The conversations I had, not only with the Aboriginal artists and curators from that territory, but also from other parts of Turtle Island, changed my life. I became Indigenous. I return at least once a year for more Biennales, cur curatorial and writing projects, and to hear and give talks, and to participate in the space I call the Indigenous. In my experience, uh, this is me doing a performance, uh, sort of like the Ghost of Riel, sort of, kind of like, and in front of the John A. Macdonald statue next to the Parliament buildings. In my experience, Indigenous and Aboriginal are not synonyms. My primary identity, for example, is Métis. I'm part of a family that belongs to a culture, a territory within the Métis homeland. My responsibilities include chairing the shared management board at the Batash site, um, one of our most important historical and spiritual places. And uh, much of my art practice is committed to extending Métis visual and material culture into the contemporary moment. And if I were less preoccupied with the space I call indigenous, I would live a traditional Métis in the Métis community, learn to jig, play the fiddle, hunt and speak Michif, but I don't. Indigenous is a relatively new category of being. 
This tertiary identity consists of Aboriginal people who ally with other Aboriginal people from around the world, especially those with a common original colonizer. Indigenous is a discursive and contingent space characterized by mobile relations enabled and maintained virtually through the internet, telephones, reading and writing, and physically thanks to rapid and for some people cheap travel. Prior to being offered the privilege of travel of being brought by, to Australia by the Canada Council, I was a very re re regional person. I had not ventured much beyond the prairies where my life and work and art are centered. That trip opened me up to new relations, places and modes of being. What separates the colonial from the colonized in Churchill's formula is that the imperialist is worldly wise. Indigenous consciousness is the development of world wisdom, but without an appetite for conquest. I did that beating myself. Someone saw my vest and said, somebody loves you. And I said, oh, I hope so. It's kind of a self-love, though, at this point. <laughs> and if you be, don't look close. <laughs> it's really wiggly. <laughs> so every Indigenous person is Aboriginal and a member of a First Nation tribe, Métis local, or Iwi. That's the groups they call them in uh, at, uh, New, uh, New Zealand. Uh, however, not all tribal peoples are Aboriginal or indig Indigenous. While our primary social identities are due to birth or adoption, being Indigenous is a choice and privilege accorded to few. Of the three native life ways, the tribal or national is most tied to land and language. Aboriginality is a relation to country, but people living in the indigenous condition is at the moment at least grounded. It exists in placeless, uh, ungrounded, least grounded. It exists in placeless places conferences, international residencies, art fairs, exhibitions, studios, and universities. These are transit spaces, also in books, over phones, and online. I see, I should say it more clearly. I'm reading it and I'm not even making sense to myself. So when I'm in Edmonton especially, and with Métis people, I'm a Métis person. When I've gone to Australia, look at this complexion, they call me a black fella because I'm, they could recognize me as being indigenous. I'm saying, I'm not a black fella. I'm kind of like a white fella, kind of, not really. Okay, what? I'm indigenous, this new word. So when I'm at home, I'm with my family. I'm just David and uh, elder brother sometimes, and dad and husband, whatever. But I'm in a Métis setting. When invaders were coming across to Canada, people realized, so the Blackfoot and the Cree, they said, we are not the same people, but we're definitely not like those people. So they got together. You have the Blackfoot Confederacy, you have uh, different groups getting together in the East because they'd be stronger together than separate, even though languages are different, right? You have these, these confederations. So at that point, you become an Indian, right? You become Aboriginal. That's a different category than who you are at home. And what I'm saying is now, in the last 20, 30 years, those of us who go to university, those of us who go travel, who read books written by people who are not, if you're Cree, they're not Cree, you're in the space of the indigenous. It's a different space. I taught once a course on contemporary indigenous art at U of A in a summer class, and I just had this intuition. It was mostly native students, and I said, who did you leave at home to come here? Right? When you're in the space of the indigenous, you know it's a different space than home space. You're becoming a different person. How do you deal with that? They got some weird customs down there in New Zealand. Yeah. This is Salate Tawali. So two years ago, Tandis, Candace Hopkins, who is a Tlingit, and I led an international indigenous residency at the BAM Center for the Arts. In one of our circles, Salate, the Fijian artist who lives in Sydney, remarked at how straight this is her thing on, I'm not black enough, isn't that awesome? Um, in one of our circles, Salate, a Fijian artist living in Sydney, remarked at how strange it was that she had to come to Banff to have a conversation that she should be having at home. Freed from having to translate and explain ourselves to non-Indigenous others, we can get on with deepening our identities and projects. In Indigenous space, we can be critical without being adversarial. Most Aboriginal and tribal politics are in suspense in Indigenous space. The great weakness of the Indigenous, however, 
is if it becomes unmoored from the identities, peoples, territories, and knowledge that ground it. The indigenous can be a form of speciali specialization. Think of this as your university career. The indigenous can be a form of specialization, which is becoming a cog easily slipped into the mainstream meaning-making machine. The indigenous must always be humbled by the Aboriginal and the tribal and by country. That's the ab Aboriginal Australian term for land or territory. I don't want to keep them on there too long. Oh, I guess I have to, sorry. <laughs> Joseph Boyden is not Métis. Neither Mi'kmaq, Nipmuc, or Ojibwe claim him, so he's not a member of those nations. Joseph Boyden may not be an Indian, but he's an indigenous person, according to my definition there. Jimmy Durham, is he showing? Is the show up yet? It's a great show. I saw it in New York. It's a great show. But it appears he's not an Indian. No nation claims him either. But he is indigenous. Indigenous is a symbolic and intellectual space. It is a utopic space. Utopic is Latin for the word nowhere. Spaces of conferences, survivor space, art galleries. These bubbles are generally quite separate from Aboriginal and tribal communities. And one can imagine non-indigenous people being puzzled by Indians, or you can imagine when non-indigenous Aboriginal people come to some of our bubbles and they say, these are Indians. This is changing. Community is increasingly engaging the indigenous space and reshaping it. Indians have long challenged Boyden's and Durham's claim of Indian status. Only recently, because of social media's dissolving of the boundaries between the indigenous and other levels of nativeness, have these voices been heard. Rachel Ann Dol Dolza, now Nietzsche Amaradiello, is black, she says, but not African American. The space of blackness seems analogous to indigenous. It refers to a discourse that includes instances of being black, of family and historical relations, but also to literature, music, and political culture that holds the parts together under that term. It is continuously negotiated, never settled. Dolza absorbed black like Boyden absorbed indigenous. From within these spaces, they said and did and made things that are recognizable within those spaces of blackness and indigeneity, but might, might not survive being tested by more grounded levels and, and by African Americans, Métis, Mi'kmaq, Nipmuc, or Ojibwe peoples. They could make significant tr contr contributions to black and indigenous, but leave more ground levels unperturbed. And so if we're acting primarily in the indigenous, we have to be worried about that for ourselves. Ooh, I've got all kinds of slides of great performances in art, but I'm not going to go there. In the light of the two unfortunate trials, I've been rethinking things a little bit. So I'm going to end with a, with a bit of a message. So my message is that if reconciliation and indigenization are primarily concerned with decolonizing settlers, then it is settler business. And indigenous people seriously need to consider how much energy they can surrender to the service of settlers when our people are in such great need. If academic indigenization is about extracting knowledge from Aboriginal communities, refining the data, medicines, stories, and so on, mostly for non-native consumption, then indigenization is a new name for settler colonialism and First Nations, Inuit, and Métis need to question their cooperations or co-options. You might have noticed, noticed people are using the word reconciliation now. Reconciliation is the truncated form of the deeper project that used to be called truth and reconciliation. If we are not careful, reconciliation light will ease past difficult truths to focus on the palatable reconciliation. Reconciliation is the myth that there was a time of Nettler settler, native settler conciliation. If reconciliation does not emphasize truth, if it does not consist of perpetual comprehension of the historical facts and living legacies of First Peoples under colonization, the land dispossession, the aggressive assimilation of children into foreign ways of knowing and being, and if it does not embrace conciliation as a continuous communion, negotiation, trust, and treaty, which, indicates rep which includes reparations and native sovereignties, then reconciliation is a non-indigenous thing, a colonial thing, 
something First Nations, Inuit, Métis people should avoid with great caution. However, if truth and reconciliation and indigenization are about making room for the expression and production of non-colonial thought, action, relations and objects centered in native bodies, experiences, communities and territories, then truth and reconciliation and indigenization are indigenous business. If reconciliation and indigenization are about living well in shared territories, managed according to principles that arise from this land, then this is both native and non-native business. Thank you. <laughs>